The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, uh, I hope you all had a good break. And uh, I came back from San Francisco on uh, Sunday. So uh, last time, uh, we talked about uh, uh, Boltzmann transport equation. And we, we made a drastic approximation. That's a relaxation time approximation. So using this relaxation time approximation, the original Bort Boltzmann transport equation, uh, on the right-hand side, it was a scattering term. If you recall, we said that it's the last line integrals, right? Because let's say when we have two particles collided with each other, we have to sum up all the possibilities for that collision. But using the relaxation time approximation, we say uh, all those collisions eventually drive the system back to equilibrium F0. So that F0 the, is the equilibrium distribution uh, function. And uh, 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 we also commented that actually this is not really strict. Uh, say there, this is, of course, it's approximation. There are many uh, ways it's not uh, uh, correct. And uh, later on, you'll say that, in fact, uh, uh, this uh, approximation will not give you the right Prandtl number when you calculate the uh, uh, fluid properties. And uh, 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 for relaxation time, we discuss uh, different scattering mechanisms. Uh, for, for example, phonon phonon scattering, uh, electron phonon scattering, and uh, scattering by impurities. And we say, uh, if I have multiple scattering mechanisms, I use a Matheson rule where the total relaxation time is the uh, inverse of all the scattering processes involved in the transport. And I want to also make the additional comment that say, uh, even though you can solve the Boltzmann equation in this format on the relaxation time approximation, and often the largest uncertainty come from this relaxation time. We do not have a good way to calculate relaxation time. We say you go to quantum mechanical Fermi, uh, say, golden rule to calculate. So that way, you have to go to quantum mechanics. And in fact, that's a, uh, say, uh, active uh, research uh, topic. Uh, for example, uh, uh, immediately I'll jump into thermal conductivity prediction, a uh, full-on thermal conductivity prediction. And uh, uh, a recent uh, uh, large step that's made in this field is the ability to actually use uh, the density function theory to calculate this relaxation time. And using this relaxation time as a fit into the Boltzmann equation, so you can now uh, solve, say, compute the property like a thermal conductivity of the materials. So uh, this is where we were uh, last time. And uh, today, we're going to solve this Boltzmann equation uh, in the classical limit, where uh, if you recall, in the second lecture, uh, we went through a very uh, uh, approximate derivation of the Fourier law of heat conduction and also Ohm's law. And you had a homework uh, on fixed law. Uh, so all those laws, uh, say, we did uh, say, uh, very, uh, say, uh, hand wavingly. But now we can use this equation rederive it. So when we went through a really long cycle to come back to our second lecture. And I'm going to show you uh, uh, today, hopefully, we'll cover uh, uh, say, uh, Fourier law, we'll cover Newton shear stress law, and we'll cover Ohm's law. OK. So let's first uh, say, uh, look at the uh, uh, general solution, uh, uh, say, approximate. So 
uh, Boltzmann transport equation is already approximation. But when I let solve it, I will solve under diffusion approximation. So I will uh, do a small perturbation method and solve the Boltzmann equation uh, to get the diffusion laws. So uh, um, say, uh, let's say diffusion approximation. Again, you here, I'm making approximation again. You can say what you learned uh, had not of approximation made, OK? And so, so what I mean diffusion approximation is that when I try to solve the Boltzmann equation under uh, the uh, relaxation time approximation, I say the, you can say, I say the, use the perturbation method, the f deviates from f0 only slightly. So the difference gives me g, and this g is orders of magnitude smaller than f0. Right? You can do more rigorous math than using uh, uh, versus, uh, say, uh, asymptotic method. But this is the basic uh, uh, assumption I'm making is g is much smaller than f and uh, than f0 itself. And this also say, because of this, f equals f0 plus g. So I'm going to substitute into the Boltzmann equation. And I have df0 dt plus dg dt plus v. And just make one more comment. This v now in the uh, Boltzmann equation should be considered, this is the group velocity of the particle. That's the particle. Uh, say carry energy at this velocity. So this is way uh, dot f0 and the way dot g. And uh, this is a r, right? Remember, uh, f itself is a function of time, is a function of space, x, y, z. It's also a function of momentum, px, pl, py, pz. Right? It's a quantity, one particle distribution function in the phase space. And uh, uh, on the uh, uh, second term, I have f. Now, this is uh, the gradient in the uh, momentum uh, components, and f dot uh, gradient p g equals g minus tau. Right? OK. So I'm seeking the first order solution. Uh, G is much smaller than F and F0. So the approximation, which you can do more, like I said, uh, better math. But basically, on the left-hand side, all this uh, higher order gradient term on G drops out under my approximation. Okay. And uh, we later on will come back to dis rediscuss when this is not valid, right? And that's in fact the content of next, cha next chapter when we discuss classical size effects. So those drops out. And uh, let me further for the constitutive related uh, equation like a Fourier law. Let me drop say also drop the df zero dt. In fact, even if I carry it, it will drop out. Okay because the f0 uh, is a symmetric function. So let me just say do steady state. This, this is not an essential. So I can drop the time term. And then with this, I have g minus tau and v dot r f0 plus uh, f dot p f0, right? And uh, so I, I'm more used to f itself, so I can go back to add back the f0. So f0, uh, f equals f0 times plus g. So I have r f0 plus f dot p f0. OK, so this is my solution for the distribution function f. 
when I have uh, uh, the uh, later, I, later on, you'll see this will be reflected in terms of temperature gradient, velocity gradient, or electrical field. These are all included in those gradient form terms. Okay. So this is my uh, approximation. I have the solution. I'm going to use this to get my flux. When I want to calculate heat transfer, I'm interested in heat flux. When I want to calculate charge, I'm really, say, the current, I'm interested in current flux. And uh, or, uh, in terms of the sh uh, stress, shear stress, I'm interested in the momentum flux. So force, energy, and uh, say, um, charge, right? So let's do uh, first the Fourier law. I'm going to use Fulon as my prototype in deriving the Fourier law. And uh, um, in this case, let's look at the Fulon heat conduction. Right, and uh, I have a uh, medium, and with the temperature gradient, let's say this is z direction, and this is the uh, t is a function of z, right? One dimensional, make it uh, easy. You can do uh, uh, say arbitrary uh, uh, 3D uh, easily extension. So uh, in this case, my local f because uh, each uh, z uh, point, there's a temperature, and uh, the F0, right, the corresponding equilibrium distribution is the Boson-Einstein distribution, right? So let's write down the Boson-Einstein distribution is exponential h bar omega kBt minus one. Right? So you can say F, F we said that is a function, one particle distribution function in phase space. This is equilibrium. In the case of equilibrium, it's a function of omega, the energy, not just not the momentum. Right? It, uh, say it, it depends on energy and depends on temperature. Temperature is a function of Z. So when I do the spatial gradient, R, the df0, the spatial gradient is real df0 dz and the vz. This term, I do not have force, external force acting for phonon, right? So this term drop out. So now I'm going to do my f equals f0 minus tau vz df0 dz is a dt if I use the chain rule, it's dt dz, right? OK, now I have f as a function. Now you can say f0 is, itself is isotropic because it doesn't depend direction h omega. But f is non-isotropic because this velocity z has direction, right? So if I have a full long actually in solid, go all direction. It's a random motion. Of course, now it's a biased random motion because there's a temperature gradient, right? So uh, full long with a group velocity in this direction, then it's z component is v times cosine theta, right? Now f itself has direction. And uh, uh, but say uh, F0 is isotropic. Now I'm going to calculate heat flux. So heat flux is, this is the distribution of one specific uh, quantum state. OK, one particle distribution function at a specific quantum state with certain momentum px, pi, pz is vx, vy, vz. Right. So if you recall, when I do specific heat, I sum up all quantum state states. So I'm doing, going to do the same. 
I'm going to do this uh, summation of kx, ky, kz. I'm doing momentum space now, right? The q is a function in real space. So I sum up all possible quantum states that fill the momentum space, kx, ky, different momentum. And then each mode, I have h bar omega, that's the energy, right? That's a one photon energy. And then I have this many photon in that quantum state. And uh, if I have polarization, I add a polarization because if you think about what we learned before on photon dispersion, this is specific k direction. I have, say, transverse photon, longitudinal acoustic photon, optical photons, right? So I have to sum up over all those photon modes, and each mode I have my solution on how many phonons at that specific mode given this local temperature T. And uh, this will not give me flux. If I divide by volume, uh, you will get the flux. Oh, sorry, I have the, this is the energy, right? If you do specifically F0, this is your energy density. Then I have to do the flux is the velocity. It's moving at the Vz. So it's a Vz, that's the component in the z direction. That's the lead flux in the z direction. OK? So once you know how to write this term from here, next is, or say you have your solution f, is converting this summation into integration. That's what we did before for density of states, right? However, when we did the density of states, we didn't care about directions. And this is, uh, this in the, in when we do flux for transport, I have to be careful on direction. Okay, I'll still use density of states, but with a twist. So let's go to write down those other terms. I'm going to con convert. So uh, Q, I look at that. Summation is a discrete number. You recall, right, uh, if I want to convert it into integration, I say dkx, that's a length in the kx direction. But see, each mode, the spacing is 2 pi divided by L, right? So the number of points is 2 pi over Lx if I have length dkx. So by using this dk, that I convert this sum over kx, how many points into integration. So I have kx integration. I have dky and 2 pi over ly, dkz, 2 pi over lz. In the past, I just use the same L. You can, it doesn't matter because at the end, the volume cancel. Lx, Ly, Lz cancel, right? So I have my uh, uh, three integrals. This is now Kx, Ky, Kz. And uh, I have to my some different polarization, different branches, P, and uh, volume. And the rest is still h omega f vz. So I have h bar omega vz. f is f0 minus tau vz df0 uh, dt dt dz. I'm just copying what I have in this expression here. Right? So the k is converting this summation into integration. And now I have dkx, dky, dkz. I have a pi, uh, two pi cubic, and the v cancel. So uh, let me, uh, uh, I, I'm going to uh, skip one, one step because there are too many of those kind of writing. Now you have the choice how to do this integration. 
right? In the past, when we do specific heat, it's always easier to convert this into integration over energy, right? Because F0 here is a function of omega. So you, 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 you say, OK, either I integrate the over omega, or I integrate over dkx, dky, dkz. But say, uh, in before, it was a pretty symmetric when I do energy. And here, I have the problem of v is a function of directionality. This is a directional, so directionality in the phase space, because this is a random velo group velocity of the particles. Right? So how I do this integration dkx, dky, dkz for this specific problem, I'm going to convert this into a spherical coordinate. Okay? So dk, dy, dy, kz, this one is uh, if I do a spherical coordinate, now uh, so I cannot do just a 4 pi k squared dk because I have directional dependence. So I have to do integrate. So this is my theta. And uh, uh, in the x, y, k, x, k, y plan, I have an angle phi, right? Spherical coordinate. So if I write dk, x, dk, y, dk, z in spherical coordinate, I get the sine theta, d theta, k square, like r square, sine theta, d theta, d phi, dk, dr. That's my. That's my dkx, dky, dkz. When I do energy before, I just simply already integrated the sine theta, d, d theta, and d uh, phi. That's giving me a 4 pi. I can't do that because here I have a directionality in my integrand. OK? So now I do, uh, 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 you can say, Because I'm doing this spherical coordinate k, I can use, because at the end, I still have to choose between k integration or omega integration. Because f itself is omega, right? I have the relation between different value of k and omega. That's my dispersion. That's what we went through before. So the other, the way to do it is, uh, say, dk, you can write dk into dk d omega and d omega. And dk d omega, if you use your dispersion, k squared dk d omega, and you can convert everything back into dense of states. Except the dense of states before is a 4 pi k squared dk, right? There's a 4 pi. But here, because I have to ca carry the angle, so I don't have that 4 pi. So I have to be, uh, there is an extra 4 pi in this conversion. So now I'm going to do uh, convert rather than kx, ky, kz integration limit, I'm going to do sine, uh, say in theta phi and k limit, uh, omega limit. Because here I'm doing the omega integration, right? So my, I have 0 to omega max, that's whatever the full-on dispersion of the material is. That's the maximum frequency you integrate to. And you will say the uh, phi integration, phi here, the kx, ky plan, right? That's a 0 to 2 pi, OK? So I have 0 to 2 pi. That's d phi. And theta, what's the integration limit of theta? 0 to the other side is pi. So the full on go in both directions, all directions, right? So this is the last difference. It's forward, backward. The picture we had before in second lecture is I have uh, uh, any imaginary surface, full on go across that surface is forward. The difference, the backwards, gave me the left flux. And here, I'm doing that more mathematically. It's going all directions. 
So here I have 0 to pi. This is my d phi. This is my d theta. And this will be my d omega. And the rest is uh, uh, polarization 2 pi, 2 pi, 2 pi. And then all this together gives me density of states over 4 pi. That 4 pi is because, like I mentioned before, is 4 pi k squared dk. I don't have theta phi integration. OK? So this and the rest is f0 minus tau vz now. Vz, if I think about this is a group velocity, right? It projected into, in the z direction, is a v times cosine theta, right? So I have tau v cosine theta v square cosine theta square df 0 dt dt dz integration. And I have sine theta that's still there in my spherical coordinate. OK? So my theta, sine theta, and I have cosine theta square. F0 itself is isotropic. If you look at my F0, is isotropic. OK? Now you can tell what's the integration of first term, F0 term. Sine theta integrated between 0 pi is what? 0. F0 term drops out. F0. Oh, I'm sorry. OK, because of VZ, VZ here. Yeah, yeah, F0. So here I, I'm, I'm, I miss this. Because when I multiply in, is VZ, V cosine theta. OK, you're right. Otherwise, it's cosine theta. That's not 0. So right, this one, Vz multiply in. Here I have a square. The first term is V cosine theta. Now integrate. So cosine theta, sine theta. You integrate between 0 and pi d theta. That's 1 half cosine theta square. It's 0, because 0 to pi. Right? So the first term drops out. And the second term is a cosine theta square sine theta integrate. So that will give you 1 third cosine theta cubic. Right? See cosine theta square sine theta d theta, that 1 third cosine theta cubic. And then you integrate, there is a negative sign in the front because the sine theta go back to co negative cosine theta, right? So there is a negative sign, but the 0 to pi. That gave me another 2. So there's another negative sign. So this one actually gave me 3 halves. 2, two thirds, 2 thirds, I'm sorry. 2 thirds, my fraction. So Chinese ways, they reverse. OK. So my, uh, what I have is 2 thirds and uh, tau v square df0 dt. This is a, the, this term drop out, this two thirds. I don't have phi dependence. That's because of my density of states, in fact, that I have made approximation, OK? If you consider real crystal in each direction, you have to do density of states in each, each direction is also different. But in, under my approximation here, 0 to pi, there's no other phi dependence. So integration just give me 2 pi. Right? So I have another 2 pi. And then I have my density of states, d omega, 4 pi. And I'm going to put dt dz. That's a constant I put out of integration. So I have negative dt dz, 0 omega max, and uh, d omega. So this is a 
uh, re-derivation of Fourier law, what you have here is the thermal conductivity K. Right? And the K flux is proportional to the temperature gradient that comes from this term. And the proportionality constant thermal conductivity, we look at it. What do we have here? Right, uh, 2 pi, 2, that's 4 pi, cancel this 4 pi. So it's one third. So thermal conductivity, K, is one third integration, 0 to omega max. OK, I have uh, uh, DFDT times density of states. Oh, I, I should have H omega. Can, that term should still be there. I, Come back here. I missed it. Here we have h bar omega. That's this term here. OK. So what I have, h bar omega times density of states times dfd 0 dt is a specific heat at that specific frequency. OK. So this is a tau. V square specific heat as a d omega. Each of these terms could depend on omega. Right? And if we you go back to notes before, hand wavenly, we said thermal conductivity is specific heat, velocity, mean free pass. That's what we did in second lecture. Now we have a more rigorous expression. And each term now depends on specific heat, uh, depends on frequency. OK. Because it's so hard to measure the mean free pass, right? And uh, I'm not sure I gave this pro homework problem before. One way is, uh, OK, I take the measure thermal conductivity. I take a measure specific heat. I take a spe speed of sound. I go to calculate the mean free pass. Right? But there is a big difference between this and this in terms of the details. The expression looks very similar. If you do this for silicon, you get a 40 nanometer of the mean free pass of silicon. But this is a very, very wrong. Okay? And people use that all the time. That's because if you look at this, full on dispersion, right? And uh, group velocity for contribute, let's say, very small in the optical phonon. You see, optical phonon group velocity is very small. When I take speed of sound, that's here. Very large value, right? But the real speed of sound, let's say, group velocity for optical phonon is very small. So they do not contribute much to the uh, heat conduction normally, right? But say, if I use the measure specific heat due to, uh, say, at high temperature, they contribute to specific heat. So I'm overestimating the specific heat for this that carries heat in the material. Secondly, my group velocity, right? If you say the speed of sound is here, the tangent, but the group velocity is changing to zero as it moves along the dispersion, right? So again, I'm overcounting the velocity here. So that estimation gives you a very wrong result. And this, like I said, 40 nanometer. And it turns out that some of those full long has a mean free pass as long as micron or even longer. According to some of the calculation we did, is about in silicon, about half of the heat is carried by phonon with a mean free pass longer than micron. So that's the difference there, right? When you start to count the size effect, if you uh, if it's, if you use from here, it's 40 nanometer. That's when you start to pay attention. But if you go from here, you say, okay, my understanding is I need to be worried about it when you get to micron range. Different conclusion. Now, if you look at the typical curve of the thermal conductivity, you do this uh, integration, right? 
and you go to check for most crystals, the thermal conductivity K versus temperature looks like this bell shape. Okay? That peak in typical material happens around 20 or say a few tens of kelvins. Of course, the change with different materials. Okay? At high temperature, this range is t to the nth power, and the theory is roughly t to the first, but this n could be 1 to 1.5 range. Okay? Why is this? Why at high temperature the thermal conductivity drop with temperature? If you check the specific heat, right? If you recall, for solid, specific heat as a function of temperature, this is a Petit Dulong regime, right? Each mode contributes one half kBT to energy, so specific heat is constant because the T derivative, right? And this regime is a T cubic at low temperature. And this here is about T cubic, and this here is about the one over T. So what's happening there? The reason is, you see here, specific heat is constant. That means the energy is a T proportional to T, okay? And uh, 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 so uh, when you get to higher temperature, phonon has higher energy, they move more violently, and they scatter more. So in this regime, uh, the relaxation time is the inverse proportional to energy, so that's the inverse proportional to temperature. Once you go to this regime, right, as you cool down, the phonon scattering weakens, so phonon, phonon scattering do not happen, say, as you go to lower temperature. The mean free pass becomes long. And uh, typically in this regime, the mean free pass can get to centimeters. So that reaches the sample size, and the mean free pass becomes comparable to the sample size. So it's a constant. And then the mean free pass is tau times V is a constant, right? Specific heat is proportional to cubic. Thermal conductivity is proportional to cubic. And in this regime, where phonon phonon is, is weak, what's really important is impurities. I mentioned the uh, say impurity scattering, like uh, relay scattering, force power. And uh, uh, so uh, if you, for example, diamond, which is the best conductor, right? It turns out that most material it has isotopes, uh, diamond, silicon. If you make them, say, re even remove the isotope, just to make the same atomic mass, right? Isotopically enrich it, you actually boost the thermal conductivity by a few times, if you can do that. So even at the room temperature there, I don't know whether that's settled, but most likely, even at room temperature in most material like silicon the, uh, and the diamond, the isotope, if you purify it, the isotope will actually, you can increase thermal conductivity. So I heard, uh, say, a few years back, probably 15 years back, there were reported that isotopically enriched silicon has a 60% higher thermal conductivity. And somebody told me there was a big factory build just to make the isotope enriched silicon because the heat cannot go out from, from the chips. I'm not sure whether they were successful at the end or not. Okay? So that's the uh, thermal conductivity. This is the example of uh, Fourier law. Let's look at the flow problem. Okay, now I'm going to look at the Newton shear stress. I have a flow, right, and the simplest flow 
is quiet flow when I have one plate fixed, the other plate drag parallel plates, right? And the velocity, say, if this is my x, so when I deal with this, this is my y, and uh, I have, in this case, when I have flow, a significant difference is now the average velocity of the molecule is now zero, right? And uh, so it's not completely random. And I have, uh, uh, in the quiet flow, I have, say, a linear velocity profile. So any place I have velocity u, and the v, of course, is zero for the quiet flow. And uh, uh, v u is a function of y, right? OK? So in this case, uh, the F0, what's the proper F0? And you can go to solve really the full Boltzmann equation, but say uh, uh, a good approximation, this is a part of the uh, uh, Kroc equation, is the F0 now is, a, rather than F0 is a FD, is a displaced Boltzmann. And the displaced Boltzmann is, a, I say, remember the Boltzmann factor is mv squared divided by exponential energy divided by kt, right? So energy is 1 half mv squared kbt. And uh, say mv, v is now the random velocity minus the average velocity squared. Oh, uh, square. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't matter. OK? So that's a displace. So v is the random velocity. I instantance, I need to say the phase space velocity. And if you average v, you get a, say, average velocity u. So you subtract that amount. This is the Boltzmann uh, distribute, displaced Boltzmann. And then say I have n the density in the front, and uh, uh, I don't rem I forgot whether the m is the denominator or numerator. So m two pi kbt three halves uh, and exponential. So. This is a, now I'm going to replace in my relaxation time approximation, replacing F0 by Fd. And this, of course, it means in my current problem, when I have a laminar flow, velocity is long zero velocity is only u, I want to make my life easier. So what I have is a Vx minus u square plus a Vy square plus a Vz square and divide by 2 kBT. The rest is the same. Right? So this is my FD. And uh, in this case, I'm going to replace F0 by FD, displaced from Boltzmann. So this is F0, FD. This is DFD. Now I have to do that derivative. Right? Go back to my general solution. Again, say I don't have a force acting on the molecule as long as I forget about gravitational force, right? Pressure is not a force in my picture. It's a momentum, OK? So uh, I, I drop this. I have way df d d r. So r, remember, in the, here, this u is a function of y. Vx, Vy, Vz are, again, my phase space variable, right? They are independent of x, y, z, OK? So I'm going to sum up Vx, Vy, Z, Vz. My real term is here. So if I look at my uh, f is then fd minus tau. And uh, if I look at this, V dot gradient RFD, right? What I have here? 
I have, say, uh, because uh, when I do this gradient with respect to r, I have dx, which cancel because nothing depends on x. I have dy because u is a function of y, right? u is a function of y. So I have the y term. So I should keep vy because of the v dot gradient, right? So what I have here is a tau vy and the df0 du and times du dy. This is my solution for the Boltzmann equation casted under the current problem here. Right? So I have my f. My next is go to calculate the shear stress in terms of the random, the distribution function f and the random, let's say, momentum space variables. So what's my shear stress? So when I consider what's a shear stress, I have velocity flow, say Vx. The molecule is doing random motion. I have Vx, Vy, right, Vy. So the shear stress is due to, so in the tau xy, what's my tau xy? What's the shear stress? It's due to the momentum exchange in the x direction going across the plan y, right? The molecule go, say, carry momentum mvx. And because the component, some of this molecule going down, sometimes going up in the y direction. So it's that exchange of momentum in the y direction across this plan of the x momentum component gives me the shear stress. So when I do the shear, tau xy, OK? And uh, I will have to integrate. Now I'm not doing discrete because I'm using Maxwell distribution, v x, v y, v z are treated as a continuous variable. So I have, say, mass infinite to plus infinite integration limit. And uh, my, say, shear stress is m v x. That's momentum in x direction. The rate of change in the y direction, that's the molecule going across the plane. Right? That will give you the molecular level expression for shear stress and the f dvx, dvy, dvz. OK? So now. You substitute your f, we have here, and you do your integration. And this is a good example where your question again is do I convert it into a spherical coordinate? Do I keep the original Cartesian Vx, Vy, Vz coordinate? Or you want to convert it into V, the energy, right? Mv squared. And for this example, it's much easier to actually keep it separate, Vx, Vy, Vz, and do your integration. So this is where I say, once you're comfortable with starting point, writing this down, and the rest is your own math choice, whether, uh, which, which uh, you, you do. So uh, in fact, uh, if you uh, uh, I jump a few steps, this term always drop out. The equilibrium term always drop out. Okay? And you do your mass, it's due to symmetry. Okay, it's an odd function. When you integrate from mass infinite to plus infinite, it cancels out. Uh, physically, what it means is because the f is isotropic, in each direction is the same. Okay? And uh, say, uh, so what if, if you look at the solution F0, let's say, uh, and uh, F0 actually is, a, uh, say, F is a F0 solution, superimposed with a deviation term. So 
deviation term in the case of heat conduction in the forward direction is a positive, in the backward direction is a negative. So it's actually this imbalance, this is your G we draw before, that's your G. The difference between F and F0 is this imbalance that's giving you the left flux. F0 itself is equilibrium, they are equal going forward or going backward, so there's no left flux. Now, when I have transport this one in the forward direction more, in the backward direction is less, so the imbalance give me the heat flux, they give me momentum flux, all this. It's, that's the, uh, uh, the physics behind this mathematical expression. So if I substitute this in, and what you find out is I write it m 2 pi kBT, 3 half. And uh, I I'm going to put this tau out. I'm going to do a constant relaxation time. OK? And relaxation time, there are different models, again, for relaxation time. And uh, um, mass infinite plus infinite. And it, it turns out, exp, exp, uh, say, exponential mvz square 2kbt and uh, dvz. So I'm doing each term separately. And uh, I have my uh, other two terms is I want to write this out just uh, to emphasize when you do different problem, you may have to choose your different coordinate, and that's your freedom. Vy square 2kbt, so this is dVy. And then Vz, mass infinite to plus infinite. And uh, m Vx mass u, and this is a kbt. That's what comes from of df0 du because df0 du have this u in the exponent. That's what I have here. And uh, uh, exponential minus m vx minus u square and 2 kbt. So uh, dvx. Uh, and in the, uh, say in also I have in the front eventually I have d d o d y. That's the Newton shear stress law. I put it out because nothing. This can uh, this is a real space quantity. It's not integrated over the momentum space. Right. So you can integrate each one. You can look at the uh, integration table if you don't know how to do those integrations. And you find out at the end, those are all constants. So what I have is really viscosity expression. So what I'm going to get out of this out of this This one, I'll have n tau kBT do dy. Now, this is my Newton shear stress law do dy. So when I have now expression for viscosity of the molecules is uh, n tau kBT. OK? You can also do the thermal conductivity, right? This is the momentum. You do your energy, you get thermal conductivity. So thermal conductivity, K, for gas molecule, is uh, you do your mass, you get the 2 fifths Kb M Kbt. So it turns out, uh, so times the N tau. So it's related to viscosity kBm mu. So thermal conductivity is related to viscosity for gas molecules. Okay. 
And uh, there are a lot of those relations. For example, in electricity, we're getting in soon, the electric conductivity is related to thermal conductivity. That's all because of the, just a different integrals of the Boltzmann equation. And in this integral, what you have here, for example, is relaxation time. And a different molecular expression, whether it's a shear stress, Vy times MVx, or it's energy of 1 half Mv squared. That's you're doing the integration of different functions, different uh, components carried by the same, uh, say, uh, molecule. Any questions? Yes. Uh, one thing, uh, usually we say the Boltzmann equation is for uh, very weak uh, scattering and uh, for dilute limit. Right. But here, why uh, it can apply to the uh, shear stress law? I didn't say it applied to liquid. Okay. You're going to do, this only apply to gas. Gas molecules. Okay. You can't apply this to the liquid. Okay. So it's a very good comment there. And in fact, say, the other comment I have is uh, if you do viscosity thermal conductivity ratio, you can't get the Planck number right, what I have here. That's because of relaxation time approximation. If you go, do not use a relaxation time approximation, you can actually get your Planck number right. So in rarefied gas dynamics, in, in gas dynamics, people have done this. Solve the full boards my equation, and I said uh, I made some comment before. If you want to find the past research and so on, boards my equation, you go to gas dynamics. There are a lot of work uh, due to the mentioned that the Apollo project when space uh, craft goes through the outer atmosphere, or you do neutron scattering. People have to neutron scattering is also based on boards my equation, or you do photon transport based on boards my equation. And uh, uh, for phonon and electron, this is a later development. So a lot of those, you can actually use those uh, other, uh, say, uh, development in other fields. The mathematics is the same. The equation is the same. OK. So now we have uh, heat, momentum. Let's do charge, right? Electron transport. So I'm going back again to say how I'm going to write F for electrons. And uh, uh, first recall in the case of uh, uh, discussion, the Fermi particle electron, we have Fermi Dirac distribution, which involves uh, exponential, mal I say, uh, E minus uh, mu kBT plus 1, right? So uh, this gets a lot of complication. Conceptually, it gets a lot of complication. Of course, your temperature could be a function of space, right? And mu. We typically call it the chemical potential, right? And uh, could also be a function of space. And uh, in fact, uh, if you recall how we define mu, right? Um, in the case of equilibrium, I say uh, if I have, for example, uh, uh, let's consider only maybe a conduction band of a semiconductor, right? Conduction band, valence band. Let's say here is my energy wave vector, right? And the way we, uh, in the under equilibrium, you see the number of charge is summation of, say, spin of all modes, and uh, each mode is the Fermi-Dirac distribution, 
right? This actually give us at the equilibrium at a certain temperature. Using this, I can find because the given temperature, I can inverse to find what's the chemical potential. If I know the number of charge, and uh, 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 say if I divide by per unit volume, and here I will have uh, the yeah the volume is divided to the other side, right? And uh, of course, what we did before is this is the Fermi Dirac, this is density of states, this is the energy integration. This is what we did before. One more step, because the density of states is a constant times E minus Ec, right? Ec is the bottom of the conduction band. Then of states. That's a, say in the front is a is a relative effective mass. You can now sit at the sit there and write yourself. I'm not writing. I'm just saying that's a constant. Each material is, uh, has a, has a, its own constant, right? And the point I want to make is okay. If I integrate E C to infinite, I'm just consider how many electrons in the conduction band. I'll find the, with this, I'll find the F, the chemical potential in the expression. But what I want to make now is a very subtle. This is, a, this is a really confusing. I was reading a book this weekend. This is a book on solar cell. And specifically, there was a paragraph by the author commenting on, on this. So say, say, students don't understand the that uh, you will not be able to measure electric field, you'll measure electrochemical potential. And they say, well, all education has a problem. Right? That's the author's comment in the book. And uh, so it's a very confusing for, uh, point. I hope you'll go through with me. Because uh, what I'm talking here is, uh, uh, if I think about this is related to the confusion come from you have electrons, you have holes, you have positive charge, you have electric field, you have chemical potential. What are you measuring? OK. And uh, 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 the, uh, so here, the electric field, uh, if I think about the energy of the electron, is this is the kinetic energy in the band, one half mv square. And then there's a, a potential energy Ec. That's the bottom of the band. Right? So I say, OK, energy is the Ec plus Ek, kinetic energy, because our effective mass approximation write this Ek as 1 half mv square. Right? Recall this Ek h bar square k square 2m effective mass. It's like my kinetic, effectively like my kinetic energy, right? This energy is relative to Ec. And this Ec is relative to whatever reference. This is where, where is your reference? In my book, I say there is an absolute reference. And in fact, I say, I don't think in my book I even draw that well. The absolute reference, the best is just to take the vacuum. Then everything is actually below the vacuum. So, so the vacuum is here, you can say, but then the energy is negative. That's even more confusing. OK, let's, let's just say this is relative, EC is relative to an uh, absolute flat level. Right? And that could be a function of x then. EC could be a function of x because different point, it could have a different uh, potential relative to that. So, so if I do this, I rewrite it in terms of Ek because mu, if, if E here, E is relative to any absolute reference, the mu is relative to the same reference. Okay? And, uh, but now I'm going to use E equals Ec plus Ek, then you'll find out that what I have here is uh, I can do my coordinate. I uh, say uh, transform rather than DE, I do DEK. So I will have EK because 
e my e say is ek. And uh, exponential uh, ek minus e uh, uh, say minus mu minus e say divided by kbt plus 1. So dek. I'm just doing my coordinate transformation rather than integrate from EC to infinite. I go from uh, EK, that's bottom, to infinite. And the point I want to make is mu minus EC, right? We said that mu is right to whatever re absolute reference. EC is right to, to the same reference. So what I have is mu minus EC is wherever my cam uh, say uh, mu is. This is a mu right to absolute reference, OK? And it's really the difference between EC and the mu. That's the difference here, right? That appears in my number particle. So it's the difference of EC from, cam uh, from e, uh, mu from EC. That is the chemical potential, OK? Chemical potential determine the number of particles in the system. OK, so here, what I have e c mass e, uh, mu mass e c, that's the separation of mu from e c. This one, let's say, OK, I'm going to do this. This is my chemical potential, e f. OK, so now I have one understanding is where is the chemical potential. Chemical potential is a driving force for mass diffusion, mass transfer. OK? The gradient. And uh, other few other quantities. What's my electric field? Right? What's the F? What's the force acting on the particle? In electricity, we know the force is related to electric field. Anybody remember? Basic relation. Force, electric field, times what? Q. Q, charge, right? If it's E, if the electron is negative, E, that, 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 again, I'm just going to carry Q. I assume a positive charge because it's very confusing, right? And then, electric potential is related to electric field is related to field that related to potential, right? And that potential, phi. What is phi? Anybody know the name? Oh, I'll put an E here. This is electrostatic potential. OK? So you have electrostatic potential. And, uh, uh, and then say the energy, uh, the potential energy, that's where all those uh, different units, right? Uh, electrostatic potential is another energy unit. So energy is a Q times phi E. U, energy of the charge, the Q times phi E. This has the unit as my E in the energy diagram I draw. Phi E is electrostatic potential. OK, and Q, of course, again, say if you take a E, Q is negative E, you got all the sign problem you have to take care of. But the force is a negative of potential. That you all know, it's universal. Right, of the negative of the real potential, not the energy, uh, not the electrostatic potential. Okay, so now with this, I'm going back. I'm coming back to here. I'm going to do my gradient.
So what I have here is, uh, say, I consider a conductor, and I have current flow inside. And it's a semiconductor. I have the local EC could vary. And in fact, the phi E will always be parallel to EC. OK, electrostatic potential. Because the Q is the potential energy of the charge, right? So potential energy, I say, this is a, the bottom of this, is where my electron potential energy is. Right? So I will say, I can always think that U is parallel to EC. And uh, now I'm going to do, uh, say, I also may have a temperature gradient. So the, this could be, I could have T is a function of X. And uh, uh, I have EC is a function of X. OK? I have uh, mu is a function of X. I have three. OK? But you say mu is my, uh, later on you will say mu under my relative, say absolute reference is my electrochemical potential. It's not just my chemical potential. OK. Uh, OK, sorry. I have for, forgot another one. My EF, I just mentioned, right? EF is the chemical potential. Because here is mu minus EC is my EF. OK? Chemical potential is driving the mass diffusion. So now I'm going to do my F0. I'm going to write F0 equals exponential EK minus EF KBT plus 1. OK? This is under my new mu mass EC. So that, that my EF is relative to the relative to the point of the EC. So now I'm going to do my, uh, uh, my F equals F0 mass uh, tau Vx. So my, here I have Vx. And df0 dx, that's the first term, right? df0 dx. My second term is f, the force. Force will be then my uh, Q charge times here what I have is the electric field is the negative electric uh, Potential gradient, right? Or is uh, Q, uh, this is my EC, so it's negative. Uh, so what I have, maybe I do, don't do Q, I will do my negative EC dx. That's false. Uh, is there, oh yeah, I should have a negative in the front, right? Negative in the front because it's a potential gradient. Force is the potential, negative or potential gradient. OK? So that's my force. And uh, df0 dp. p is a momentum. Right here, you say my ek is uh, p squared over 2m. Right? It's px squared, py squared, pz squared. MVX, M, M, say, right? MVX. So this is a force in the x direction. That means this one it should be DF0 DPX. OK? So DF0 DPX. But the F0 is not a function of PX. It is through EK, which is a function of PX. So I use chain rule again. Is D uh, EK. D E K D P X. Right? Okay. 
So d e k d p x is what? d e k d p x that give me just p x. That's just m v x. Right? Okay. So this term is m v x. And d e c d x. Okay. So here I will get another vx. I get another vx. So I will have similar vx. But now df0 dx. df0 dx, ef is a function of x, t is a function of x. Right? So I'm going to write it into, uh, 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 so. So when I do df0 dx, I know ef is a function of x. But here I do df0 dk, dek. So I see ef and ek is just a changing position, negative positive sign, right? So when I do my first term, def dx, I, I have to do partial, right? df, df is ef, df dx, and df dt, dt dx. But I'm going to keep my rotation simpler. So I'll always convert back into df dek. OK? So I'm going to do df. The first one is d, OK, uh, df0 dx is df0 uh, dek negative, because here I'm really doing def d. Uh, so d e f d x. That's the e f. Take care of my e f as a function of x. Okay, my second time takes care of my t as a function of x. And then you do that. Uh, uh, let me write this into. Uh, in the in that case, what I write is. Again, I write the D because of, for my rotation, df0, dek. I still want, the, even though it's dt, but I write the dek. So the difference of the, with respect to the dt is ek minus ef kbt. And I have dt dx. So, so I'm writing this. EF is a function of x, T is a function of x, that derivative into three, two, two terms. Mathematically, they are equivalent because of this exponential function. OK? One more step, I will stop. Today, I, I have to finish this one, OK? So what I am going to have then I'm substituting in to all the three terms now. If I, after I substitute into all those three terms, what I will get is uh, f equals f0 plus tau vx. And I will have def dx plus dec dx plus ek minus ef and kbt and dt dx and def df dek. So this is when I combine this term with this term, uh, with this term, and write this term here, I get my final expression. And one more step you can take is this two together, d e f d e c. You can say my mu, the chemical potential, is e c plus e f. That's relative to any horizontal actual reference, right? This is related to electrostatic potential, phi e. 
This is related to the chemical potential. So my mu is electrochemical potential. Here, what I have here is the electrochemical potential gradient. And here is temperature gradient. So what do you will say if I continue in the next class, I use this F. I can calculate current flux. And you will have the first term is the electrochemical potential is always the driving force for the current flow. You don't measure. You do not measure when you put a voltage probe. You don't measure electrostatic potential. You measure always the electrochemical potential. That's the, what the book was commenting, I said. OK? And you do battery, you deal with the electrochemical potential. You do semiconductor, you do any time, you do ele electrochemical potential for the current flow. When the electrostatic, whether you can measure electrostatic potential, in fact, there are ways to measure. For example, it's, a, it's a basically if you have pin junction, right? You have a semiconductor, you have P type, N type, and there's potential difference. One way to measure is using a cantilever atomic force microscope, approach it, and the electrostatic charge will actually expel this differently. But when you put, put an electrical lead there, you always measure electrochemical potential. Okay, so that's a, 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 the a, most time we're not careful in talking about this, and it will take you a long time to appreciate it. Okay, it always confused me, in the sense that the charge is negative. Um, yeah. Okay, I'll stop here. <laughs>